Hey, good morning. Good morning. I'd like to meet you. Hi. I'm Molly Marshall. I'm president here. Oh, hi, Molly. And Buff. Buff Bones. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Great. Great. What a beautiful space. Thank you. Just we, so many oh, nice details. We, we love it. We love it. We love it. Yeah. Oh, really nice. Uh, moved in January 2019. So. Oh, is that right? Yeah, we've been out of New Brighton for a number of years. All right. Oh, it's just fantastic. Yeah. Really nice. More rooms here to those come. I guess we're at 10. What's your name? Uh, Steve Clemens. Hey, Steve. I'm Bob. Right. Nice to meet you. And Lynn, hey, good. I know Lynn. Good to see you. And Eileen. Now, you said we met in Bemidji at the, several years ago at the protest. Is that where we were together? Uh, yes, where yeah. we were almost arrested at yeah. the intersection. <laughs> Yeah, yeah I was arrested. Yeah, I'm not sure you could call it that. It yeah. was so, it's almost like theater, but it was. it was. But it was like training for the cops that right. we, we gave them their practice, and they had their big bus ready to take us all away. Right. And then, did you go to court afterwards? Yes. Yes, we and, uh, were all there in court, right. and we were be we had been cited for stopping an intersection in Bemidji for protesting nine three. And the judge, when he heard each of us tell what was our job and what did we do and why did we, why were we trying to stop line three because of right. climate, because of children, sure. because of native sure. rights, because right. of every reason, the judge said. You guys are doing the right thing. <laughs> I love it. Just go back yeah. home and keep doing what you're doing. Yeah. <laughs> Remember that? Yeah, you gave us community service. Gave and us we said, can we use our community service we'll do what we're with doing. the Sierra Club? Sure, yeah. Right. Yeah. Keep up your good work. You still owe us $150 or something like right, that, right? right. Can we use our community service to protest yeah. more fire? Right. Yeah. And and Mr. Paulson from Wider said, I actually run in like a water protector camp on a reservation. Yeah. Like, can I be doing that? And the judge goes, go for it. Yes. I like this judge. <laughs> I know. That's good. So the end was was Right, and the cops were disappointed. They didn't get to. Then the students were tired. We had a student there who was sort of the study. They couldn't. It was a large group. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Winona was with us. Right. Yeah. Welcome to those who've come in. Oh, good to see you. Yeah, come on in. Okay. Welcome. Glad you're here. <clears throat> hey, well, I'll dive in. My name is Buff Grace. I'm with Minnesota Interfaith Power and Light. Um, and hey, good morning. Come on in. Yeah, make yourself at home. Do we need more chair? Um, here, here. Looking at the um, topics for the sessions, uh, this session is probably. The, the most remote from water, not that it's remote from water, but maybe a little bit more. Hey, good morning. Come on in. Adjacent. <laughs> yes, thank you. That's a good word, Jason. No, there's not. Two chairs. But one thing I noticed is that water is a great indicator of climate change. Mm -hmm. If we look at um, climate change and the evidence of climate change, well, certainly in the consequences, water is one place that shows us what's happening uh, most clearly. Air certainly also, but uh, perhaps uh, over a longer period of time, water has shown that by water holding the power of the heat that's uh, filling the atmosphere. So, um, so that might be a, a valid reason to talk about climate at a, um, talk about at a, at a uh, gathering about water. Um, our organization, Minnesota Interfaith Power Light, has been around since 2004, and we uh, work with uh, faith communities, 
to build a transformative power, bringing the lights of everybody's unique individual lights to addressing the climate crisis. And we work with about 250 congregations right now in our orbit around the state uh, to, to address these issues at, at all different levels of engagement. So uh, why would we have a climate conversation? What would be the value? Uh, well, the first thing is clearly what we have at stake. Uh, and we'll get into that in a little bit. But um, we might also say we'll, we'll have a climate conversation because it's effective. Uh, it, it helps. It works. Uh, that would be a good one. And what what are we doing in a climate? Yes, come on in. Have, have a seat. Join in. Hey, glad you're here. Um, a climate conversation helps us uh, get to shared purpose and identify what our shared purpose is. Um, and that's what we, MNIPL, sees as leadership. This is a, a um, definition from Marshall Gans, who is a, a kind of a father of uh, modern day organizing in a certain way. He teaches at Harvard, he teaches a class on organizing. We use some of his principles. His and name, I'm sorry. Marshall Gans. Yep. And uh, this is his definition of leadership. And so our leadership within the climate. Uh, change response arena, especially with faith communities, is to accept the responsibility to enable others to achieve shared purpose uh, in the face of uncertainty. Of course, life is always uncertain, so we, that almost goes without saying. But the intention is to find some shared purpose with the people that we talk with. Um, Shared purpose takes all of us as individuals, these little tiny fish in the ocean, and puts us into some kind of direction that uh, can respond to the principalities and powers of which we're kind of captive that have created this dire situation in our world. And that allows us to answer that in a way that brings our values and our shared purpose together to respond. Uh, Marshall Gans has a very uh, complex series of understanding this. Uh, shared relationship and shared story would be kind of at the foundations that would be that shared purpose. And then uh, I'm not gonna go into all of these, but just wanna to point to the fact that there's some direction that shared purpose can take. But today we're talking mainly about the, the conversation that helps us arrive at shared purpose. Uh, shared purpose can, can help us connect with any uh, party, or any person that's um, within, the, within the world and has a certain position or uh, acceptance or response to climate change. You know, we can have a kind of conversation with people who are complete deniers, and we can have a conversation with people who are very much on board with the concepts uh, scientifically and, and morally and ethically. Um, and depending on who that person is, that will kind of establish what our shared purpose is. And we might be seeking to engage that person just to move them one step uh, or, or collaborate one step more in what we call the spectrum of allies. This is from the Yale Climate Communication Survey. Maybe you're familiar with this. Uh, for about the last 15 years, Yale has been doing these opinion polls of people all across the country. Um, thousands and thousands of respondents, and they've identified kind of six uh, areas of understanding about climate change. They, they use the term belief. Uh, I would disagree with that. I think uh, acknowledgement might be a better word there, but at any rate, um, these, these kind of sketch out uh, who we might, who might be in the room and who we might be talking to as a person that is morally concerned about climate change and wants to engage folks there. Um, you can see that they've uh, got some data for the last 10 years that shows the change in people's opinions in the world, um, or in America, sorry. And uh, you'll notice um, that alarm and concern are the two sections that have really increased over the last 10 years. Um, you know, we've gone from about 38% in those two categories to 53%. So you see the tide is really turning. People are much more aware of this. They're either experiencing it in their own life, the, the consequences of climate change, 
or they're um, you know, or or they know someone who is, or at least they're seeing this in the news. So to some extent, uh, decreasingly do we need to convince people that this is happening, but increasingly we need to find that common ground so that we can move together as a as a human species to to respond to it and solve it. Uh, one of the concerning things, this is a, from a couple of years ago, is that the folks in that alarmed category are only about a third of them are actually doing anything. So the opportunity is really huge, isn't it? That we can engage folks and move us all. Folks can help us move to action and we can help others move to action to, to do something. Well, ultimately, just as water uh, holds the generative power of the sun, uh, we can hold some power to achieve a shared purpose and affect some change. And that's ultimately what we're aiming for in the climate conversation is uh, building that shared purpose so that we can go somewhere together in action. So now I wanna talk a little bit about how we have a climate conversation. And this is just one way to have a climate conversation. Um, I encourage you to uh, take these principles and dovetail them with other things you've learned. This is m and IPL's kind of approach. Um, so I'll, I'll talk about that. Uh, start with connection, continue with education and lead to action. Uh, we start with connection uh, for this reason. Dr. Britt Ray said it best. You may want to read this aloud for us. I can. Thanks, Brittany. The process of realizing the dire track of climate catastrophe we are on, we are on understandably arouses painful, understandably arouses painful and even despairing emotions. This is ultimately a good thing because we all need to feel about this crisis and not only think about it. We're going to burst through our defenses um, if we're going to burst through our defenses that otherwise thwart action, Dr. Brick Ray. Thank you. Uh, we find that it's pretty typical. Um, maybe this is an American thing, but it's pretty typical with climate change to start in our head with facts and figures. That's often how we're presented uh, with the information about climate change. Um, and so at MNIPL, uh, because we are an interfaith uh, organization, uh, and this is a moral issue and a spiritual issue, we, uh, and because we're kind of working against the tendency of starting in the head, we try to invite people to start in the heart. We'll get to the head, but let's start in the heart. Uh, we find that when you mar marry how and why, heart and head, that's when you go to action. And people are disposed to start in the head. So we start in the heart. And we start in the heart by asking, we, we ask people to reflect on what their vision for this relationship with the earth is. In a deist, in deist faiths, um, you know, there's a tripart relationship, God, human, earth. Uh, in other faiths, there's just the horizontal earth-human relationship. But everybody tends to come, even if they have no faith at all, so to speak, they come from some set of values that predispose them to have a, a picture of what it looks like to be in relationship with the, with the earth. And we invite people to go into that space. So if I'm, if I'm presenting to uh, an organization, or, you know, a particular church or synagogue or, or mosque or temple, I'll... I'll do a little homework and know kind of what their basis is and invite them to go into that space. Or I might show up and ask them about that. What, what's your faith talk about there? Or maybe I'm just talking with one person or two people, but it, pretty quickly we can get on board. Uh, this is a beautiful quote from Thich Nhat Hanh, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with. And here's you know, what Thich Nhat Hanh is saying at a particular moment about the Buddhist uh, experience of that relationship. And then I invite people, we invite people to, to think of a moment when you've actually tasted or smelled or touched that experience, when you've had that experience of a connection and you've, you've experienced that vision that your faith or, or your kind of values construct has had with that. 
Um, if I start, you know, at this stage, hey, I'm taking climate action because people are suffering or my faith tells me to, or creatures are dying, or I want goodness for my grandchildren, those types of things, then those are ideas and they kind of push me, uh, they push my listener into their head. Mm -hmm. But if I, if instead I go into a story about, hey, let me tell you about this time that I experienced this connection with the earth and I, I tasted what I think of as the goodness of my relationship with the earth and with God, then, you know, that, that invites my listener to go into their heart and then they can start to resonate with where I am. And then they often will come back with, oh yeah, let me tell you about this time that I experienced that. And this is what, you know, this is what I tasted. And then we start to get the earth and, and the spirit in our conversation right there in between us, right? Oh, instead that. of having, instead of having a mm -hmm. mental discussion, we're inviting that third uh, entity into our space and between our hearts. And it's in there that we can start to find that shared purpose. Uh, any, how does that resonate with people? There just any kind of comment or question or thought? Yeah. It, it really mirrors um, the work uh, that uh, I've been involved with, uh, which is the work that reconnects out of Joanna Macy's mm -hmm. practices. Mm -hmm. And it, I just love how you you kind of, you know, really short up, you know, this tadook, tadook, tadook. It's very helpful because now I can see how all of these other things that we, I've been studying fits. And um, I, I really appreciate it in that um, I've been... Um, looking for a mean that's big enough to yeah. control all of or to, to house all of the issues. And one of the, the main issues that we've been siloed because that's business as usual to, to get us into our own little camp, mm -hmm. our one agenda, right? Whether it's water, whether it's food, whether it's uh, police reform, whether it's equity and jobs, you know, like, and what, what holds that whole thing? And it's solar punk. And I don't know if anybody's ever heard of that here, but it's an incredible movement around the world. And they're doing some of the same kind of prescribing of how to get us into these conversations, how to get us out of our head and get into our heart imagination. And they, they offer, you know, um, this kind of the similar things that kind of fit is, is you, you, you have to, you have to, we have to help people envision something beyond what business as usual. And that's Joanna Macy's work. Business as usual is one of the themes and the great unraveling is the other theme. And then this great turning, how, how do we get us into that space of the great turning, which is that space between us? So it's lovely how this just mirrors. Thank you for that. Um, the philosopher, uh, and no, sociologist Rosa talks about resonance. And that seems very much what you are describing the capacity to be present with others and to find the kind of reflective space mm -hmm. in uh, being with others mm -hmm. uh, in a common concern. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I also love um, a good story. And I just think that really helps us connect on a soul level. Myth, stories, and um, poetry, song, you know. So I really appreciate kind of highlighting that that is kind of the good way to start on connection level with people is to tell a personal myth or story. Yeah. We find that um, when we present this in a larger group, not just like a one-on-one -on -one or, mm -hmm. you know, small group discussion, but when we present to a large group, it, it, it tends to be that we have to Invite, we have to tell a little bit of a story of connection to help people kind of understand what we're inviting people to. Mm -hmm. um, it tends to be people want to think of like, well, this is when I sat out in this absolutely gorgeous setting and saw a sunset and felt the presence of God and was meditating. You know, it's kind of that um, high experience. So I often tell a story of like, when my nephew and I saw a little beetle 
crawling on a block or when we had Thanksgiving dinner and we tasted this great food or try to pick the very ordinary things in life that, that are a connection with the earth so that we can kind of broaden the field of experience so that more people can get get in to that experience so if you only kind of if if i were to come and talk talk about you know the time that i spent five weeks in the boundary waters you know that that's a very inaccessible uh experience for many people and it's not actually any better than uh some very simple uh experiences that are very accessible and that everybody has on a daily basis almost mm -hmm. you know so that's that's what we try to uh, describe so that people feel welcome to come in with whatever they're bringing that they've mm -hmm. experienced i think yes. the simple thing when you said just everyday observation perhaps is is that um, we live on the river we have a boat right down at harriet island yeah. And uh, it is the most fabulous thing in the world is to live on the Mississippi River. I've been involved in the Mississippi River probably since I've been six, seven years old. But the biggest thing of all is, is that if you just pay attention to the skies and wait and see the sunset and the sunrise, that to me is all you have to do is to look at the beauty of this world. And even this morning, I think if you all looked out, you saw that big orange sun out there. Mm -hmm with her the forest fires that are coming and it is what we're doing in the earth i guess I, I must be part indian because i do believe it's mother earth and we've got to take care of but just look at the sunset and sunrises can i push back a little um i'm thinking about some of my neighbors in the high rise i'm i live in seward and most of the folks in the high rise are ethiopian somali and they don't have much access to playing outside. Um, you know, even, even the park nearby, you know, the kids have played on the grass so much that it's more dirt than it is, is grass. And I'm, I'm wondering, we have to make sure we're able to connect with, with especially those young kids uh, in this conversation. Thank you, yes. Yeah. yeah we have to, we have to ask questions that invite people to teach us about their own experience so that we help we we're observers and witnesses with them as they discover that place of connection right that's a very good point and and what folks come up with may be very different than what we expect yeah yeah thank you um, so once we've been in that hard space and we've uh, tasted some of that connection with one another, then it, it is important to move into the mental side of things and the thinking side of things. Um, here's a quote from uh, Bill McKibben, who you may know as a, uh, one of the top client scientists in the world, wrote a book back in uh, 1989 of one of the seminal books about uh, works about climate change. He said, I feel I know just as much about climate change as anyone in the world, but what surprises me, and that's an indicator of what I don't know, what surprises me always and forever is just the speed with which things are happening. Mm -hmm. The stuff happening now is stuff that back when I was writing The End of Nature, we thought would happen in 2080 or 2100. Yeah. It's extremely important to keep figuring out different ways of getting across this enormous truth. So the very first thing to notice here is that someone, even of uh, Mr. McKibben's knowledge, he's still acknowledging that he, he's learning. He doesn't know everything. So in the same way, we need to be uh, learning. Uh, if we're going to participate in this finding shared purpose that works towards effective action, we have to be teaching ourselves. Um, and then the second thing is, we need to balance the the details with the big picture. Uh, maybe you've been in a, a conversation where someone wants to go down to the micro micro level with very fine details that actually obscure more than help us see what's really at stake, right? And that you know this is what uh, McKibben is showing in this area also. You know, is that um, for him. 
the big picture right here is the speed with which this is happening. Um, so he he's saying we really got to we we need to understand the urgency that we face with this crisis. Um, there are other aspects of that big picture that we can talk about, but um, and, and I'll get into that in just a minute. But yes, you had a comment or a question. Yeah. Um, I can't remember her name off my hand, but she wrote this really interesting book. Um, the name will pop in later. Just the idea of how people, when when confronted with crisis, find the better nature of their their angels of their better nature, and that you know, unfortunately, good, right, or wrong, that there is a chance that people will connect, and that we will all find ourselves in a space of going, okay, what do we need to do? And that the idea is, is that there's enough of us that have great, you know, the sky's falling, but guess what? We've got a plan. You're, you know, there's there's a way to do this. It's very, very helpful um, to be able to respond a, a, as a, a movement. So, so I guess where I'm struggling with is it's so easy to use our imaginations and believe the worst, but I love when we can offer that we can believe the best. That in the chaos, there's opportunity for some amazing things to happen, especially when we allow spirit to inform and, and guide us. Well, right. I think, you know, um, I just had an opportunity to go to Denmark and be in Copenhagen. And um, they are going to be carbon neutral by 2025. Oh. Right. So we're talking two years, that entire capital, they'll be the first capital of a country in the world to be carbon neutral. And as we, you know, we watch people swim in the harbor. And we watch that they're replacing parking lots with microforests and that you can smell clean air and everybody's on bicycles and people are walking. And, and I, I looked at it and I had a moment of, and this is a story, a moment of it's not impossible. It can be done if people care about creating green space, if people care about their fellow man, if they're not worried about what do I have versus what do they have. And they're doing it. And the other, and that's another speed thing. I would never have thought that any capital in our in the world could do that in the next two years. And they are on their way. It will be done. That's inspiring. That's it is. Great. I mean, and they're doing things like they're getting rid of parking lots in the city by three percent a year. That's one of the way they're forcing people to use public transit. That's all electrical. Yeah. They put in infrastructure so every taxi cab must be one hundred percent EV. And they have free charging stations for those taxi cabs. Yeah. Like they, they just they they put their money and their effort where their mouth is, so to speak. Yeah. But that's we're not hearing that story as much as we're hearing the doom gloom. It's all going to be a burning ball of and right. and people don't think there's a way to come back. Exactly. So I think that's the other side of this. We need to what's happening, yes, but what's also happening that we can we could start to adopt these same kind of practices and the speed at which they're getting that to happen, it's amazing to do. Yeah. Yeah. You, you all have jumped Something. forward to action. So let's let's go there. Okay. But let me just touch on a little bit more on education and we'll get to that because I think you're right on. So we we try to paint that big picture for folks as you know, we say, look, carbon's a normal everyday element. It's, it's in everything. It's in us. Car there's nothing wrong with carbon. But carbon, anything in the wrong quantity in the wrong place is toxic. If I have too much water in my lungs, that's a bad thing. So, uh, you know, we try to paint that big picture that, yes, the, the atmosphere is heating up. It's like putting on too many blankets, just in very simple terms to try to explain it. But we acknowledge that there's some real hard science data behind it. Um, you know, we point to NASA. We talk about the last, the last 800,000 years and how it's very clear that carbon has risen dramatically since 1950, and that correlates with the huge surge in rising temperatures of the planet. I'm not, I'm not going to go as in detail as we would if we were in a presentation mode. And then I talk about some of the key pieces of education that are out there that you know, confirm beyond any doubt that this is real, that it's happening, and that it's caused by human activity. I mean, I'll point to the IPCC, which is the UN group of scientists, you know, including thousands of volunteer scientists. It's the largest um, scientific peer-reviewed uh, effort in the history of the human species. Um, Drawdown is a really good uh, resource if you are familiar with that? They have a really good 
six unit uh, session it takes about 37 minutes, I think, to watch all the videos very clearly and calmly lays out the um, rationale for the theory of climate change being true and also talks about some key co systemic concepts for how we're going to, as a species, change and, you know, put solutions into place that change this, like the ones you're noting from Denmark. Here's a couple of great climate change news sources, if you don't know about them. Um, there are a plethora of great news sources out there. It's really grown in the last three years. It's just exploded. And there's more and more niche sources, you know, folks that are talking about air source heat pumps or folks that are talking about biodiversity or folks that are doing news within a certain niche of climate change, EV, EVs, you know, something like that. These are a little bit more broad. Heated, I noticed, does a really good job of identifying greenwashing. They're really good at, at finding you know, companies that are promising one thing but doing another or whatnot. Uh, Ariel Samuelson there just joined the heated team. She's from NASA, NASA scientists. So really good quality. And the Inside Climate News group has about 19 reporters and editors. They do a great job too. They're nonprofit. Um, here are some specific information sources from Minnesota. Um, you probably know about the climate gas from NPR. There's, the DNR has a climate page, and the University of Minnesota has a climate adaptation. So if you're looking for specific uh, information from Minnesota, that's good. And then what we typically do is we don't tell people a bunch about the consequences because we find most people already know. They're seeing it in the news. So we ask people, what do you know about climate change? If we're doing a presentation, we try to engage people uh, and ask them what people are, what they know. And then what we find is in a room full of people, they can pretty quickly identify the key things that we know about climate change. They don't need a bunch of people. They don't need me to come tell them about climate change. What they need perhaps is for a person leading a climate conversation to, to affirm that yes, what you're hearing is correct, and then to contextualize it. Now, remember that big picture, the Earth's atmosphere is heating up and we're seeing these consequences because of that, something along those lines. But I have these slides when I give a presentation just in case we haven't really got a group that has seen some of the direst consequences. And these slides are a little bit old, you know, I need to update them already, just from two years ago. And you know, we got more things that have happened that are more current and more on people's minds. So uh, I do spend some time, if it hasn't come up in a conversation um, with the fact that this is a justice issue, it's not just a scientific issue, um, it's a justice issue. And that it typically, as with many things, folks that have less resources, fewer resources have less ability to respond to the changes and that um, you know and so you know and depending on the context and how much time we have and that kind of thing uh, we might get into the moral teachings of whatever faith that person comes from and you know how they're called to work for justice in the world um then after that heart and head together uh, particularly in a presentation situation, we invite people to kind of get in touch with <laughs> what, how's all this discussion make me feel? What, what's going on in my body? You know, and I'll, I'll really often ask people, uh, you know, how do you feel about this? And they'll maybe say despair, maybe guilt, maybe sadness, maybe anger, you know, um, maybe like any number of different things. And I even invite people, as I've been taught, um, you know, where, where's that feeling in your body? Where are you getting this? In, where's, where are you feeling it actually in your body? So you really get people in touch with that. And they know and they know that because it's harder to move on to action if you don't uh, get in touch with those feelings. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, if you do get in touch with those feelings, then taking action can actually be um, resolving not just moving towards resolving climate change, but actually resolving the feelings that you've got and, and helping uh, that with that internal dissonance that's inside you. Um, so then we go to action. Oh, um, yeah. I'm so sorry. 
have you have you not found that there needs to be some some kind of somatic practice that you offer as well? Because it seems to me, and especially from the Joanna Macy work, that moving on to action, I mean, just identifying it as one step, but being able to actually release it is, is a really important step. Otherwise, people are still in their fight, flight, or freeze, which is that sympathetic nervous system, right? Yep. You know, just acknowledging that, oh my God, I feel it's, it's kind of reinforcing, oh my God, I'm really in my fight, flight, or freeze right now. Ha. Has that not been a part of the process that you're seeing is effective? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I have not done a lot with that, and I, I do recognize the value of, of that. Um, there's a variety of ways to do that, probably contextually fit to who you're speaking with. If I'm presenting to a group of, say, Christians, then maybe in that context, I might uh, have prepped the uh, pastor to offer a prayer at that point. Um, maybe we would just stretch uh, if if it's a different type of context. Uh, maybe we would just have a 30 seconds of silence and people can kind of move in a way that you know feels good to them. I think those are valuable. What, what I what I what the pushback I would like to share is that it seems to me that we're still very much in white privilege modality with this and you know um coming from a white privilege great race training that that we really need to offer as presenters the the need for doing our reps um that's what i find kind of uncomfortable with this presentation is because we have this opportunity to really while we've got the attention to offer a couple of reps show model how those reps can be done and I, I appreciate the stretch and the prayer, but sometimes we need to go a little bit step further. So that, that's what I'm just saying to everybody. It's, it's how do we move into this courageous space of offering just one more level of engagement that could really provide this ability to move into the, the digestion of the parasympathetic nervous system because it's much easier to, to feel what your part is to come through when you're not imprisoned by that fight, flight, or freeze. So that, that's the piece that I, I, I'm really curious. I wanted to hear how that was going to come across in today's work. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks a lot for that. Offer, man. Uh, Reverend Lennox Searwood Jr. says, men and women who lead faith traditions are important because they have a duty to address injustice. Probably the most important thing is to believe that we were made for this moment. We are so needed. Our people and our gifts are here at this time for this movement. As overwhelming as the crisis may be, we can do this if we all come together. So, you know, I, I think that as we've heard this morning, there may be particular visions of success uh, that we want to put forward as uh, our member who just had to step out was explaining, uh, you know, telling us about that wonderful thing happening in Copenhagen. It's good to have those kinds of success stories that we can talk about. Um, and it's good to point to, you know, leaders in the movement who, you know, are, are giving us comfort and encouragement. Uh, and this is one quote that we often use for that. So a couple of things that I invite folks to think about when they want to take action is instead of going through a long litany of things I can do, um, I try to give a, we, we try to give a framework for how you might think about what you would do. This comes straight out of a book called All We Can Say that you may be familiar with, an anthology of women writing about um, climate change and climate response. And this is from Dr. Ayana uh, Elizabeth Johnson. And she puts that Venn diagram, you know, where what brings you joy, what you're good at, and what needs doing all kind of come together. Another framework that we use is the three-legged stool. Uh, so we invite folks to work in simultaneously in the practical, systemic, and relational. If I'm only doing practical actions in my household, and that's all I do, then I'm going to be cut off from some of the wellsprings of my faith, and I'm going to be cut off from that larger systemic work. And I'm going to get tired of just doing my little piece, and I'm going to think when the going gets tough with that, why am I doing this? This is just, this isn't making a difference. It's just one more drop in the bucket. 
if I'm uh, so I also want to be working at those larger constructs. I want to be you know working with systemic and systemic might is often construed as legislative. It doesn't have to be legislative. It could be working for the school board, getting okay, a member change. It could be working um, at a network level of your faith community or you know expanding what your faith community is doing to others. Um, could be working with a group of businesses that you're connected with. Uh, systemic doesn't have to be political or legislative, but it often is. If I'm only working at the systemic, then I'm liable to be hypocritical. I'm liable to be, well, I want to see this big change out in the world, but I'm not sacrificing it all in my own life. So we find that when you do those two together, you you got the you're in touch with your own difficulty for make, for being the change. And so you're more likely to be uh, really in the flesh and blood of the systemic change that needs to happen. And then the spiritual and relational is very important as far as being in a relationship with people who are experiencing the worst of this. So, you know, I don't know about you, but I'm I'm a person who lives pretty comfortably. Um, I have my little postage stamp of yard with my little garden, and like Voltaire says, I go and cultivate my own little garden, right? Um, but if I'm regularly introduced to people who are facing the worst of this crisis, I have a lot more uh, impetus to get moving, and I can't sit still in my own little uh, comfortable place. So that's the relational aspect. It's not just spiritual, but it's also relational. And we're kind of winding towards the end here. Um, so in a climate conversation, you can uh, arrive at a place where you both feel like, oh, yeah, what action could we take together? And you can be very open-ended. You know, if you're in having a climate conversation with somebody who you're already in community with, maybe there's already something going on in your community and you want to figure out how to get on board with that. Or maybe you're just exploring, like, what could we do together? But you may be part of a group that's having a climate conversation because you want to move that person to action. And then you want to have a specific ask. Hey, will you show up at this time for this purpose to do this action? And that's what that, that's somewhat in the Marshall Gans theory that's called the story of now. And the story of me, the story of us, and the story of now. And then uh, this is some work that you, you know, as a group, you can do to, to really move your actions into you know, things that actually happen. And there's various different uh, structures for doing that, making them, you know, smart. You've probably heard of the Smartify, having a strategy, having a vision of what your action is going to accomplish, tactics to get there, and that type of thing. And then I'd just like to close with Rabbi Friedman here. Uh, is there something that would be more than that? Great, thanks. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Make an activist awake to the pain of the world and a parent sensitized to the needs of my child are both really practices in heartbreak and in giving and receiving love. Integrating the two is new and hard, and I am doing my best to face the challenge of curiosity. Recalling the image of the body's immune system, I'm reminded that no single cell can fight alone. These days, my deepest solace and strength come from connecting with other parents and activists, sharing our heartbreak, and walking together on the road of love, the surest ground beneath our feet. Thanks for reading. I think there we hear some of what she's talking about connecting with people. And that's what the climate conversation is, is to connect, to connect with one another about this you know, biggest crisis in our, in our world. Uh, I really appreciate that. I wish we had more time. I really appreciate that. Uh, in, input that we've heard here today, and as you can see, you know we're we're evolving this conversation as quickly as the context in which we're giving it evolves. So I appreciate what you offered about the somatic experiences, and the, uh, you know I've, I think we do need to do more with our model in uh, offering visions of of you know positive uh, action. Uh, things that are to to contradict that uh, doom and gloom that we can't, we're not going to win. We're not. It's not going to be resolved. We're all going to die. Uh, so it's important to include that and that. And I, we need to update our our method 
with that kind of thing. Yeah. Can I ask, did MNIPL or other groups in the cities plan on doing any um, group transportation to the climate march at the UN on the 21st of September? But Pivot has been pushing to try to get groups to go. Um, and I didn't know, I know what 10 years ago or so we did a bus. Well, we did three or four buses over here in New York City um, for that big climate march. And it, it really was helpful for people on the bus to share their experiences because it's a long trip and all that. So you might well, thanks for bringing that up. I, I was not aware of that. So I, I yes, you we haven't started working on that. She, she was part of the organizing for the, okay. the one several years ago. Great. Can you share the date again? September 21st. 21st. It, it, um, and I don't know the details other than it's a march on the UN uh, so about it, everybody getting involved in climate issues um, um, in support of the international panel uh, and their report saying we're taking it seriously. What city, Steve? New York City. Why do we have to wait for these marches to become active? No, I'm not saying I'm not saying I'm not, I'm not suggesting you are, but there's people who are actively on the ground every day, 365 days of the year, actively, you know, opposing that narrative that climate is, a, climate is not uh warming is not a reality. So we don't have to go to Washington, DC. We don't we can go right here in neighborhoods in our community. We can plant our gardens. We can build, reach out to children and young people who are passionate, uh, you know, about global warming and climate change, and join forces with them. You know, I mean, I'm I'm always awestruck by where we talk about the future is now, but then we kick the can down the yeah. road. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, I just I just want to uh, praise MNIPL for. Um, taking the lead, at least as far as I can see, um, in developing a deeper understanding of um, reparations. Yeah. MNIPL organized a four-part series um, to educate folks in the faith community um, around the issues of uh, racial reparations, where I think there may be an opportunity um, is for those people uh, who are uh, talking about reparations and understand the extractive character and the repair that needs to be done, um, you know, in terms of uh, white BIPOC uh, disparity, that that also is a, a relative to the reparations work that we need to do with Mother Earth. Mm -hmm. So there are people on both sides of that discussion um, that I think need to figure out a way to intertwine um, those that discussion more effectively. Very well said. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to make a comment about, you know, this the deep somatic work, and I, I'm definitely on the same page uh, that that is a huge part of what's needed in this movement. I also want to say or add that I think very intentional containers need to be created around some of that work so that it's Absolutely. not just sort of like plucking it into a to any old Absolutely. you know thing you know those are that is some like deep grief work that our bodies need to go through and we need to be in containers with professionals and people who can help us hold that sometimes well well said and yeah. I, I, yeah. I didn't add that piece but i would have if i you yeah. know because yeah. we're on the fly and 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 there are some practices um especially within the joint mac work that is kind of leveled. So we can do kind of just a touch stone mm -hmm. on something like that, that doesn't trigger people, right. but yeah. still offer the counterpart into these kinds of conversations. So it's just worthwhile to check in on what you're sure. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you can hear us, Uriah, but uh, if you'd like to make a comment, we haven't invited you. Yeah. Uh, hi, I'm actually here to leave my workshop. <laughs> So, oh, this has been a wonderful listening time. Uh, you. Thank you so much. <laughs> this is uh, uh, much of the discussion that you've been having here is what we've been talking about in class this semester. And so it's nice to hear people outside of the institution uh, speaking about it. All right. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Hey Michael, how are you doing? Good, good to see you. I'm going to see you. Yeah. Uh, thanks for your comments. And I, I planted trees with you when the online or works. How are you doing? Good for you. It's terrific. I'm going to feel all the way. Good job. Um, you see where the nature can so that we've got four million dollars to be funny for sure. Uh, yes, I have it right. Yeah. 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 Oh, I'm not missing the one. Just a little bit. Oh, there you go. Um, did you need direction? Um, no. You're in the city uh, discussion about uh, the two rivers. Yes, we do. Yeah, we do. Right back. And Uriah, people are still sort of moving between rooms, so get gathered. Don't worry. Systemic kind of systematic is why I want to interject. So I just wanted to somebody I rely on that. Uh, yeah, me too. To. And I just think in this great session on modern you know, and well-being and a fair uh, physical energy and part of it is it's not a a study in my own Well, that's, I like that, but I get a, a, a vision of that. Yeah. Um, so I think it's been How many put in person? Um, there are about oh, that's, that's 45 that. people here. That's pretty good. Yeah. That's we forgot to count. So now they're spread out all over the building. So I mean, that's, that I might be a lot harder. <laughs> Bunch of ministers doing that. Hey, Uriah, are your slides available at all? Like to share? I really like I'd like to be able to hear what you have to say because it 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 puts it paints a positive future. I'm guessing there's a piece there of like the life as we want it to be, right. and there's another one that's kind of like that too that feels really relative with food. That yeah. um, and Anna's a great presenter. Um, what's your email? Twenty one two one S T Sand Turtle Twenty First Century. Oh, you need it too. <laughs> I'm trying to get and I just want to shoot 21 S T yeah, Sand Turtle. Yeah, Century C E N T U R Y O R A C L E at gmail.com. 21st century oracle at gmail.com. Yeah, I'll send them over to you. Thanks, Ryan. I appreciate it. I really wish we could be in more than one place. <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> Talk to the Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Want to go ahead and share with me? Sure. And then, then we'll share the recordings, Dan. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, I got really fancy and uh, figured out how to share my screen while also being able to see my presenter notes. So if nothing else, I gained a new skill. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. All right, well, for the recording then. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Jerry Williams. Uh, I'm a licensed settled pastor here in Shawano, Wisconsin at Peace United Church of Christ. Um, in my second year preaching there, and I'm in my second to last semester here at United uh, on the Masters of Divinity and UCC Studies track. Um, given the nature of our discussion, I would feel like it would be a dishonor to not do a land acknowledgement uh, that I'm currently presenting to you from my home office, which is on traditionally seated Menominee land. Uh, and we'll be focusing on uh, the relationship between the Tomashano now and the Menominee tribe, uh, whose reservation is just north of us. Um, 
And last disclaimer, I'm by no means an expert in these topics. I've done some, uh, some research. I've had quite a few conversations over the past year, um, but I, I, there's definitely probably some stuff that I've missed as well. Uh, so to begin, uh, I wanted to ask a little bit about you. Uh, so first, this is an aerial photo of Shawano Lake, uh, which is one of the three main bodies of waters that we'll be talking about today. So I kind of wanted us to think about um, what are some ways that you use water recreationally? What are some ways you use water commercially? What are some ways you use water spiritually? And how do your communities interact with water in these contexts? Um, Dr. Sabia Tannis, I don't know if you want to offer some reflection. And sure. Why didn't they join me? Is this the, the second round of workshop? Okay. Would you like to join us? Yes. That would be lovely. So your Uriah is just it's just getting started and has asked us to reflect on a couple of questions here uh, about how we use water. Yeah. Uh, so uh, one way we use water rec recreationally, or I use water recreationally, is, is we love to kayak. Uh, so um, in the lakes around here, and we're planning a big trip on the St. Croix next weekend. So to, to go kayaking. Yeah, that's a beautiful river. Yeah, I'm really. I, we haven't we haven't kayaked it yet, so I'm very excited. Um, uh, I also recognize that 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 the river moves the waters move things that products and things I need um, commercially. Absolutely. Up for you. I'm very conscious that um, I I have a large garden. It's about a, a thousand square feet that is adjacent to my home um, or where I live. And I'm very conscious of the the way in which um, water is accessible to me. Um, I have a I collect rainwater um, as a way to um, water my garden, but occasionally I have to use uh, potable water. Mm. Uh, and I'm thinking about that as I'm doing it because of, you know, the, the lack of access. Um, I mean, it's such a privilege to have uh, ready access to potable water, um, you know, when you compare to what is not available in other parts of uh, the world. And then you know, I'm also aware of how, you know, enormous amounts of water being pumped out of uh, aquifers, yeah. uh, literally being drained, um, you know, as, as we're talking about it. But um, that's kind of moving into the commercial yeah. uh, space. But, you know, thinking about how water in my garden interacts gets me into thinking about those relationships. And I do want to talk some about the uh, relationship to uh, water and uh, commercial settings. So. Absolutely. And, and that's part of what we'll talk about here in just a second. Um, is, is there a way that uh, any of you connect to water spiritually and use it spiritually on a uh, semi or regular basis? Sure. Sure. This is Bill. This is Bill. Hi, Bill. Uh, sorry to be late. Um, uh, so I'm mostly water. So that's pretty, that's pretty spiritual. <laughs> um, oh, well, there's a voice in here speaking about that. So that feels spiritual. Yeah. Um, yeah, I try to respect water, and then, um, but I do, I spoil water too, so I'm guilty, because I, um, a lot of what I do for money requires water to uh, clean the tools and in the processes of uh, construction and 
mm -hmm. shame and all that. So trying to have awareness, that seems spiritual to me. Absolutely. Uh, to go with awareness. Uh, oh, I also really like the forms that water takes. Yeah. So uh, Trinitarian form, which mm -hmm. um, I find that fascinating and really important. And um, so it can help tease out some tough concepts that uh, if people want to engage in such things. Uh, the forms that water takes is a fun play, way, way to play. Very much so. Absolutely. Does that, does that fit with where you yes. wanted to go, Brian? Okay. Yes. And we'll, we'll circle back around. Uh, so we have Bill, Dr. Sibia Tannis, and uh, I didn't catch your name, sir. The yeah. Len. Len? L-Y-N-N. Okay. Nice to meet you. Same. So we're so uh, I explained uh, before Bill came into the room. Certainly, this is an aerial view of uh, Shawano Lake, and this is where uh, I live. Um, not on the lake. I don't make enough money as a pastor to own a home uh, and be privileged to live on the water. Um, and just to do the land acknowledgement again, because this is the main focus. Uh, is that Shawano area where I currently live is traditionally ceded uh, Menominee land. Um, we're going to talk about that quite a bit, that relationship between uh, the mainly white uh, settlers of Shawano and the Menominee people, and what role water played in the encroachment of that. Uh, so the context is Shawano, the town now. Uh, first, I want to make a note that Shawano uh, is actually a Menominee word, uh, and it means to the south of. It was the southern border between the Menominee and Chippewa peoples. Um, at one point in time. Uh, I say originally inhabited by the Menominee people for many generations. Uh, in doing research, uh, the Menominee tribe uh, can find that they have ancestors here as far back as 10,000 years ago. Uh, so this is, this is very much their ancestral homeland. The first white settlers arrived in 1844. Uh, there was a logger who came up from Nina, Wisconsin and recognize the value of logging along the Wolf River, uh, which runs north to south. Uh, and the town itself would eventually be incorporated in 1871. And there's three main bodies of water, plus a fourth one that we'll talk about a little bit. Uh, we'll be talking about Shawano Lake, which is over 6,000 acres or, or 25 square kilometers. The Wolf River, and that runs north to south, and that's 225 miles in length. And then the Red River, which is a, a flows into, meets up with the Wolf River. That runs, I believe, west to east, and that's 74 miles in length. So in Shawano, uh, it's very much a tourist town. This is a picture of the Wolf River uh, with our tubers on it. Recreation is very important to the economy here. Uh, boating, fishing, tubing, different water sports. We have a professional water sports team that I guess performs every Wednesday. Uh, I've not seen them yet myself. Uh, Shawano County Park is a huge draw. There's various campgrounds around here that are on uh, the water. There's one company in here that I wanted to lift up because it, it's a great business idea. Uh, I don't know if you'll feel ethically the same way about it afterwards, but uh, it's called the Wolf River Tubing Company, where he provides uh, tubes, kayaks, canoes for rent. He's right off the Wolf River. You can get it, uh, rent a tube, float down like uh, the people in this picture here. And then there's a shuttle service that brings you back up to where your car is. So uh, if nothing else, it was a very good uh, venture capital idea or business idea. Um, uh, I would assume that it does very well, uh, especially as our town tends to influx during the summer with tourists. There are a couple of commercial ways that Shawano uses the water. Um, there's the Wolf River Dam, which would have originally been put in to help uh, control the flow of logs, right? To have more control over when things are moving and when, or and where rather. There's the paper mill, which I don't think uses very many, uh, much water anymore, or maybe it does. Um, it's just off the river. I'm assuming back in the day when it was originally put in, 
there was a lot more of a reason for it to be right off the river. Um, and we had a lot of boat businesses in town to maintain all the private boats. And it's, as I said, a tourist town. But one thing that's been very striking in the last uh, year and a half, almost two years I've lived here is um, the lack of a communal spiritual connection to these waters that we are on uh, constantly. Uh, as I interact with my congregants, I hear a lot of um, individual connections spiritually to water. A lot of them find a lot of their spirituality when they're on the lake, uh, whether that's kayaking or they're hiking next to the lake. Um, but it seems that there's very rarely been a communal sense, uh, which is very striking. And I think very different than maybe how the Menominee people would have viewed the water um, back when, before the encroachment happened. So a very abbreviated history of Shawano area. Uh, 10,000 years ago, the uh, Menominee people settled around Shawano Lake and the Wolf River, thriving off the abundant wildlife and their farming practices. Um, which I had the great joy of listening to Rebecca Edler uh, earlier this year, who works at the Sustainability Institute for the College of Menominee. And she shared at our association annual meeting that they found archeological remains of raised garden beds that are 2000 years old, where uh, the Menominee people had transported soil uh, up from over by the water that was more nutrient rich and brought it up to, into the forest by their villages into these raised garden beds so they could uh, participate in their farming practices. Uh, from 2000 years ago, it's just, it's amazing that without modern science, that was just something they intuited or, or researched. Um, it was fascinating. In 1844, the first loggers arrived. Um, in 1866 is when a military road is connected between Shawano area and what will eventually become Green Bay, Wisconsin. Uh, so goods were then transported with greater ease. Uh, and the 1880s, there was a major flood that took out many of the dams and bridges that had been built along the river. And at that time, there's uh, a misunderstanding is how the Wisconsin historical sites uh, worded it that happened between the loggers and the Menominee people. Uh, and at that time, the troops were called in to prevent an uprising uh, from the Menominee. Very interesting to, I couldn't find what that misunderstanding was, which is a little bit telling about our history. In the early 1900s, that's when lumbering begins to decline as an industry. And so that's when Shawano really moves from that uh, lumber-based uh, to tourist-based economy. Something I didn't have on the timeline, but it's really important. In 1961, the Menominee tribe is one of the first tribes to have their federal status terminated by the federal government, um, in part due to a court case that they won uh, just a year or two earlier, where they had sued the federal government and had gained eight and a half million dollars um, for the ways that the government had mistreated the land and forests that were provided for their reservation. Um, so when the government was deciding which tribes would lose their status first, they figured that since the Menominee had just had this big influx of resources, they would be okay economically should um, they not have all the benefits associated with sovereign status. However, this was economically tough and devastating on the tribe. Their assets drained from over 10 million in 1954 to just $300,000 by 1964. Uh, by 19, December 1973, they were regranted their federal tribal status. Now in 1975, uh, I share this um, knowing that my father-in-law has some very clear memories of this event. There was a 34-day standoff uh, that occurred as a group known as the Menominee Warrior Society. They took over the Alexian Brothers Novitiate uh, just outside of Red River, Wisconsin, and on the Red River. That was a former Catholic abbey. And this takeover was amidst a land lease negotiation for the land to be leased to the tribe to be used as a rehab center. Uh, and so the um, two main reasons that, that um, some of the Menominee Warrior Society members said they participated in this takeover was to help speed up that land lease 
uh, which, which ended up backfiring because the building and the land was then deemed unusable for a very long time. Uh, it was just last year that the somebody bought the building and has now started uh, renovating it. Um, and they said that it was as a sign to their other tribal, uh, their tribal cousins, brothers and sisters that were still fighting for their federal status to be restated. Uh, they wanted uh, members to take matters into their own hands again. Many of those that were members of the Menominee Warrior Society, uh, they were veterans of the Vietnam War uh, and had gained a lot of combat experience as many of our indigenous Americans did. My father-in-law remembers uh, the National Guard being called in for this and having to provide room and board uh, for those soldiers. I, I believe I read there was over 2,600 uh, soldiers eventually called in to help uh, quell this 34-day standoff of, I think it was about 30 Warrior Society members. So very overwhelming odds. Uh, the Mo Menominee today, uh, the reservation is where the majority or about half of the Menominee live. Um, their seat for the government is just north of Shawano, about 20 minutes north. That's in the town of Kashina. They are on their ancestral homeland, which is something they value very, very much so. There are a total of five villages uh, and 235,000, a little bit over acreage compared to the previous 10 million acres that the tribe inhabited before Europeans came. The primary industries would be the entertainment. Uh, they get a lot of casino traffic on the reservation and they have a really thriving logging industry. The tribe is extremely focused on sustainability and that, that's very, very evident in the logging that we'll talk about uh, a little bit in the next slide. But only about half of the tribe of 8,700 members uh, can live on the reservation. That's due to lack of employment, uh, lack of housing, and an aging infrastructure, which a lot of northern Wisconsin is experiencing that aging infrastructure, but uh, it's especially kind of rough on, on the reservation. So I took this aerial photo uh, from um, Google Maps, the satellite image, and I outlined the rough borders of the reservation. Uh, the blue outlines are uh, the one that's kind of left to right. Um, that's the Red River. The north to the south one is the Wolf River. And then we have Shawano Lake. Uh, so I just want us to notice uh, the density of the forest on the reservation, so within the red line border, compared to almost mm -hmm. immediately outside of it when you look on the uh, right-hand side of the image, uh, so to the east. That forest, I believe what Rebecca Edler taught us was that it has never been clear cut. That was not something they believed was sustainable, uh, given that they were going from such a large chunk of land down to the small one. They had a really smart um, tribal governance that recognized they need to care for the land very early on when they were put on the reservation. And I believe what Rebecca said, and I could be misquoting here, is that they've harvested now five times the weight of the total forest without clear cutting, which is fantastic just by caring for the land the way they have. Um, I also want us to notice Legend Lake, which is in the southeast quarter of the reservation, uh, just north of Shawano Lake, which is highlighted. Um, it's really unfortunate, but most of the shoreline was sold uh, to non-Menominee people beginning in 1968. Uh, so it's some prime land on the shoreline uh, and got subdivided and then sold to a lot of white people who are looking for lake property uh, and for second homes, um, which is something that I think a lot of uh, the tribe disagreed with and still kind of regrets today. You also notice that there are two main highways, uh, 55 and 47, that run through the reservation. It's very surreal. Uh, driving on Highway 47 uh, because it's it's just a two-lane highway and you're just surrounded, and engulfed by this forest. Uh, there's no passing lanes. You can't, it's very curvy and whatnot too. Uh, it, it's very surreal to just be out there and know that you could be totally alone. <laughs> 
And so I wanted to think about what's really been taken because of water as Shauna Lake and the Wolf River brought the initial settlers here. Uh, area being a big one, uh, sacred life-sustaining access to water, the sturgeon, which is the picture off to the left, uh, they no longer run. They run through the Menominee land, but they can't return because of the dam, the Wolf River Dam. Uh, so as they run down to spawn, uh, they don't make it back up to the Menominee land in the traditional route, I believe. And there were a lot of basic rights that the Menominee people had to fight for and still continue to have to fight for. Which leads us uh, to a short discussion on the relationship between the Menominee people and the white people that inherit Shawano uh, today. There's a lot of work that still needs to be done. Um, there's a lot of animosity that lingers over the events of the novitiate in 1975. Uh, that's a deep wound that is still felt in both communities. There's a lot of racism still in our school systems. I'm not sure when they desegregated, but it still is not great as, um, again, members of both communities have um, parents and grandparents that remember certain events and, and seed hatred rather than trying to repair relationship. And then doing research for this project, uh, it was fascinating to learn that uh, the Menominee tribe still has to continue to fight for rights of water. So as recently as 2020, the Menominee River was named one of the 10 most endangered rivers in America. And in part, uh, this was because there was a gold mine in the upper peninsula of Michigan, a, a gold and sulfur mine, I believe it was, called the Back 40, uh, that was going to further pollute the river. Uh, seven counties in Wisconsin and then Menominee County in Michigan had said, no, this is a really bad deal. Uh, and there was a hard work from a coalition of tribes to include Menominee. Uh, that showed how the environmental impact research hadn't been done properly. And so finally in 2021, uh, a judge overturned the wetlands permit for the mine to be built. So this picture, I know it was of the Menominee River. I'm not sure what the building is in the back, but that was the picture that um, a lot of the news stories had with it. So before we get into our discussion piece, just a recap of encroachment and this process that happened. Uh, so again, it's fascinating to me the role that water played in our, our colonizing of this area. In 1844, a logger saw the business value of the Wolf River. So he starts lumbering. He came up from Nina. We assume, you know, he brought at least some family with him and started this sawmill. In 1866, a military role is connected between Shawnee and Green Bay. And it's not hard to imagine at that point that goods and services are flowing now into this region that uh, we valued as European settlers and colonizers. And that as people began moving here, more and more land would be uh, demanded and they could start playing ignorant or um, blatantly ignore uh, standing treaties that might have existed with the Menominee people. In the 1880s, we had that first uh, initial military response to dispute. In the 1900s, uh, as white Shawano community transitions towards tourism, that really starts to make the water more and more valuable once again. In uh, 1961, the tribal status is taken from the Menominee. And this is economic economically devastating, and the status is then restored in 1973. Uh, 1968, that's when Legend Lake is then encroached upon, even though it is on federally protected reservation land. Uh, and in 1973 to present, continually having to fight for the rights of water and people, such as with the proposed gold mine on the Menominee River in 2020. And so given this information, what do you think uh, could or should or might be done as some reparative work uh, to repair not only the relationship between the Menominee people and us, uh, uh, the white people who have settled here now, but also between the land and the water, uh, bearing in mind that harm has been done by our ancestors, uh, harm continues to be caused today in different forms, that water was and is at the heart of much of this harm. 
What are some of your guys' thoughts? Well, a um, couple of questions. Yeah. Let me uh, start by asking how many times have you uh, given this presentation to um, people that uh, are in your locale? None yet. Uh, this is my first time giving this presentation. Okay, so uh, this is really powerful. That's the reason I'm asking the question because um, it leads uh, necessarily into a discussion about uh, what form should reparations take. Um, you know, classically, the discussion about reparations uh, roughly falls into uh, two categories. Uh, reparations uh, for stolen labor, uh, descendants of slavery, um, reparations or land back. That may not be the, the I'm, I'm trying to figure out from looking at the maps whether allotment has been uh, one of the mechanisms that's been used to break up or fractionalize the, the, the property of the reservation. Um, that'd be something I'd be interested in hearing more about. But I think, um, you know, my my hope is that out of even this small group, um, that you would feel encouraged and perhaps even going forward, stay in touch with us to um, feel the uh, encouragement to take up a reparations discussion um, you know, in your community, uh, particularly the faith, uh, you know, communities, because we've got somebody in the room that's working with Minnesota Interfaith Power and Light, and that's a significant portion of the work that um, they've got staff that are focusing um, on some of the land back uh, characteristics, but that may not be the best way to move in terms of reparations because um, even where the land is restored, the economics make it impossible for uh, you know tribal members to uh, stay on the reservation. Um, you know in Minnesota, well, I can just stop. We don't need to talk about specific tribal entities in Minnesota, but um, there's some real similarities in what is happening here. Not surprising, right. uh, and what you're describing there. But uh, if you take one thing out of this, brother, um, you know, let's continue to talk about how you engage people in a discussion about reparations, because it's clearly a situation that calls for that. Right. Thank you. Um... And we'll talk uh, the next couple of slides. There's some things that have been done already. Uh, very minimal. Don't get your hopes too high. Um, but And I can share a little bit about some of our plans at PCCC going forward. Um, other, other thoughts? What was your prompt? The, what, given the context that the water is played, uh, and that the harm has been done around here. What are some ideas of reparative work, uh, either with these two communities that could be done or with the land and the water rights and access? Um, so it sounds like you're soliciting from us things that you could do there. That, that'd be the intent, or maybe in general, uh, you know, as, as. I don't know. I don't know that, but what I can say is I appreciate your approach, the storytelling that draws us in. I mean, we just had, we did, Buff just presented on um, a model for how to go about bringing people into action. And your storytelling was a first step in that as an example of how, it, how it's done well. So thank you very much for that. It includes education. And then we're about to do action. So, and Lynn is my buddy. He's from the Church of Reparations. So uh, that's his, he's operating off his faith-based 
commitments, and I'm with him on that too. So uh, we have similar stories here. I can commit to trying to be able to tell similar stories and how it's important for me personally, and then I will engage you in networking for reparations, reparations stories, and a reparations network, if that's helpful. That is. Thank you. One thing that I think is pretty obvious, you've probably already done this, um, but, you know, reaching out to connecting uh, with the tribe, uh, uh, Menominee people, um, and potentially other tribes. So I know there's a lot of reparative discussion going on in uh, Wisconsin. Yes. So, you know, it, it, you need uh, more than just Bill and Lynn and Buff in this meeting today to keep lifting you up because um, it's a struggle. Um, you know, settler colonial uh, attitude has seeped into every part of your community. Absolutely. So, you know, the, the defensiveness, the backlash, um, you know, you'll, you'll get a few people initially that will, you know, uh, lift this up. But you got to have the tribe and those people involved if, if they're not already. Um, and maybe I'll just ask a different question. How have you engaged them? So let me let me go to the next uh, slide. Uh, I'll cover that information and then I'll respond to your question. OK. So here here's a very limited amount of what I know has been done. Uh, Chamber of Commerce has a new director as of last year, who is also very, very committed to um, this work of reparative justice. Uh, she's been a great um, person to work with as a person of color herself. I've learned quite a bit from her. Uh, and one thing that was very striking uh, was that, uh, again, it sounds, as I was thinking in preparing this uh, presentation, it sounds very minimal, but given the deep-seated uh, hate and unrest in this community, it felt big, was that uh, she asked for the president of the College of Menominee to come and give a land acknowledgement uh, at our annual awards uh, banquet for the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, I'm pretty sure it was the first time in the history of Shawano that um, not only was a Menominee tribal member asked to come be a main presenter at um, at this chamber event that has almost you know 80 percent of our businesses came to it but also to acknowledge that the land that we were on was not the, our own originally um so that felt big the dnr i know as part of some of the reparative justice uh in regards to the sturgeon uh, which i don't know all the logistics around uh, how the menominee people interact with sturgeon uh, i believe it's in a much more spiritual manner than um many of us do. Uh, each year, they the DNR comes and grabs some of the sturgeon, and they move them up past the Wolf River Dam and into Menominee River, which that's actually a bit east of here, um, and into different areas uh, on the Menominee Reservation. Then, you know, one act of reparative justice was the federal tribal status being restored as of 1973. Now, I was not planning on sharing uh, what some of the church has been doing uh, or some plans that we have in place. Uh, but in response to your question, uh, when, uh, and when we went to our association annual meeting, I had two, I had one uh, previous church president with me and I had one council member with me currently. Um, and we didn't know that Rebecca Edler was going to be one of the pre presenters um, at this, at our association annual meeting. So what's the denomination again? Just remind me. The Church of Christ, UCC. Okay. Um, oh, and he recently, <laughs> he recently started, moved to this area and started this church. All oh, right. Oh, so you're you're clergy. Right. What was that? You're clergy. I'm not ordained yet, but yes. You're on the way. Oh, okay. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so at our annual meeting, uh, to make that connection with Rebecca was huge, uh, and one thing that's come out of that is we are hoping to um, host either this fall or this winter, uh, we're kind of hoping for fall around the harvest time, uh, a joint community meal, uh, a cross-cultural meal uh, to invite members of both communities together and kind of 
include aspects of uh, cultural food from both sides and start a conversation around that and just begin to form some tighter relationships than have currently existed that I know of. Way to um, go. So it's been really fun working with that. The, again, the director of the Chamber of Commerce is very all for that idea as well. Um, Rebecca was very much for that idea. Uh, the semester is a little bit full for me. It's my last full-time semester, so planning has not gone as quickly as I would like. Uh, but that is one of our ideas going forward. Um, we have two members of the Menominee tribe as part of our church and one member of the Dakota tribe as part of our church as well, um, who learning from them and talking with them, they are also in support of this idea. Uh, uh, what the two of them are on our praise band team and they have connections to um, traditional Menominee mu music performers. Uh, so they've already been on board with bringing some music into this event as well. Um, so it's, it's a very fledgling idea still, but it's hoping that we can start that entry point of recognizing the personhood of each other and hearing each other's stories um, and forming that relationship, which I think is key to any uh, change. I don't know if it was this class or a previous class with uh, Dr. Sabia Tanis. We went in depth and talked about uh, Nelson Mandela and the work that he did. Um, and changing the hearts and minds of the prison guards that were willing to really inflict a lot of harm on people to see them as less than human. Mm -hmm. uh, and I feel like sometimes that's what happens in this community. They're not seen as other, both ways, not seen as other humans, uh, just seen as, as nuisances almost. And that's just not right. Um, that's not a value of the UCC. That's not a value of my congregation. Um, and so that's something that we're hoping to work on. Yeah. So does that answer your question a little bit, Lynn? Yeah, um, I have more questions, but I kind of... You want to celebrate them a little bit? I do. I, yeah, I think, uh, uh, you know, good. <laughs> Okay. Uh, and I don't really want to mean that. Sorry, I'm like, oh you know, man, we got an organizing situation. I'm not going to pass yeah. it up. Yeah, oh. well, let's celebrate this, gentlemen. Oh. And I'll also mention that Uriah is a relatively new path. He moved to Shano recently. And so this project is part of his own um, uh, research into the situation and part of yeah. this process of moving moving forward. So. Yeah, way to go, Uriah. Good leadership. Thank you. Uh, I have another idea too that I'll uplift, and we only got like two more slides, so we can just chat. Uh, so one idea was a that I've been really pondering more of is a more communal view of water, right? Um, so this is, again, the satellite view of uh, Shawano area and Shawano Lake. For 18 miles of shoreline, there's only six public uh, boat landings, uh, one of which is on the Wolf River Channel. Uh, so it's a channel that runs between the lake and the Wolf River. And one is on Loon Lake, which is just north of uh, Shawano Lake, much smaller, meaning that for 18 miles of shoreline on Shawano Lake, there's actually only four public accesses. That's not a great ratio in my mind. And there's only one public beach that I know of, and that's at the Shawnee County uh, Park, uh, which is the top left. Um, you see the Shawano County boat ramp, the county park is just uh, right there as well. Everything else surrounding the lake is, is private or commercial property, with uh, the majority being private property, private residential. What's very uh, disheartening and, and wild to me is that um, a lot of that second homes for people, that's cottages that they have that they only use in the summertime or they rent out throughout the rest of the year. Uh, it, it's very heavily taxed land, so it, it becomes very unaffordable for um, uh, many people, uh, even Menominee, white or otherwise, uh, living in this community, uh, it becomes a status symbol to have a house and land on the lake or on the river. Um, now the taxes go and support our local government, which I'm not well for that, 
uh, you know, we need money to operate. And yet, uh, as at that same chamber event, uh, the MCs made a joke, and it was very unfortunate that it was true, uh, was that more money gets spent in Shawano County on uh, maintaining snowmobile trails than it does on maintaining roads. Uh, so I don't know if that's quite where the tax money, if the heavy taxes on this lake land is uh, going to where it should. And so I just have that, that question inside me of what would it look like to have more public access than private uh, to this land and to this water source? Um, and it's just, it's very, I don't know, it just seems wrong to me the way that we're viewing uh, this domination side of, um, well, here, I have it on the next slide. Water brought white settlers to this region 180 years ago. The white view of dominating the earth led to the displacement of a people. Relationships are still forming and reforming, dividing and healing, but I do believe that change is possible. And this picture is of my wife and I. Uh, we're kayaking the channel in this one between Shauna Lake and Loon Lake, um, where one of the six public boat accesses are. <laughs> And then I could send these too, but these were some of the references that I used for this presentation. But it seems as though we have a group that is good at talking. So that's wonderful. Uh, we have about, uh, what time are we supposed to send? 11.45, 10 minutes uh, that we can sit and chat. So what are some thoughts, questions, comments, concerns? Well, I'm two things. Um, go to the um, MNIPL website and click on reparations, and uh, you will find a, it's called uh, the ecosystem, a reparations ecosystem. And it's a, it's a Venn diagram that um, has uh, overlapping um, areas. So, uh, truth telling um, is a significant part of what um, you know. The the process begins with spirituality, action, reparations. Um, so that could be helpful just in terms of helping people see kind of how the 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 different aspects of um, this work interact with one another. Um, there is, and, and, and to, if you just Google, uh, probably even while you're sitting there, um, restorative actions, Presbyterians. Um, yeah. There's a, a Presbyterian program from the Senate of Lakes and Prairies that um, has worked through um, a, a wealth surrender program uh, which is pretty significant because it's a uh, it's more than just you know uh, truth telling you know I'm sorry we uh, you know created these harms which is a necessary first step but it's never adequate you have to go to the point where there is some form of uh, resource material repair um, and there's an example for you to use in your work with some of your congregants or, you know, potentially other denominations that you're in touch with. Yeah. And some of the, the Native folks that are part of your congregation, you know, I think would be really excited that yes, you know, this is an example of something that, you know, could be done. Um, and you're not that far away from being able to come and visit and, you know, talk to some people face to face. Um, you know, because they've, they've done some stuff from the heart, but they also have some really great um, graphs, information. They've analyzed the white BIPOC wealth disparity, you know, which is the kind of thing that, you know, when you put that in front of a lot of white folks, it's like, where do you run from that? Right. It's, it's, it's impossible right. to, to look at that and say, oh, well, this is really not a problem. Um, it's not only a problem, it's getting, it's getting exponentially worse. Right. Anyway, um, well, that's one thing that um, you know, we realized here in Shawano as well. Um, I also serve on the United Way Board, 
And uh, in particular, as the economic gap has grown, uh, we've seen, um, so as the disparity grows, we've also seen uh, the rise of more and more overdose and drug usage. Uh, and so one of the biggest projects that United Way was just working on this past year, and part one has been uh, actually initiated as of the last couple months, uh, was to have a rehab center uh, put into town uh, that also functions as a warming center, as well as now we have a uh, recovery house. Uh, this first one is just for women and children. Uh, then their next step will be to have a home for uh, men. Uh, and, and I don't know if children will be a part of that one. And to eventually purchase a third home to have a third recovery house as uh, family oriented. Um, which it was despairing to see that the number of tribal members who are who are participating in the drug use, but when you're looking at coping mechanisms, uh, that tends to be one that's easier to turn to, um, not just for tribal members, but for anybody experiencing that economic gap. Um, so that's been a really good, I think, uplifting project that received some very initial um, pushback on uh, from different people because everybody loved the idea until they found out the house was going to be put in their neighborhood. Uh, and then all of a sudden it's, well, no, not in my backyard. Uh, so it was wonderful to see that they finally, uh, we didn't break ground, we bought a house. So. <laughs> but then to build new, uh, we, we bought one, which was great. So, yeah. Any questions or comments? Uh, I, I'd offer uh, to kind of make the case for um, some bit of a balance between thinking ourselves into a new way of living and living ourselves into a new way of thinking. And I do this in the context of a family, my wife's family, She's one of four siblings, uh, children that are going to any day now come into ownership of land that came to that family in 1946. It's on a lake. They they are a family that uh, this lake's in central Minnesota. It's very much like the lake you described. They have it as a second home. Uh, the home actually burned. And they haven't rebuilt it, but the land is still there. And the the siblings describe, I think, a range of thinking on reparations. My wife wants to return the land to the indigenous folks who live there, already active in her family to try and get that to happen, all the way to another sibling who says, you know, a treaty is only valuable until it's broken. And this has been broken. So why are we even talking about this? Mm -hmm. So that I think that person, you know, is is never going to think themselves into a new way of living mm -hmm. the way my wife has. I think if there's some kind of constructive process that can return that land, then that sibling might live himself into a new way of thinking. Mm -hmm. The fact that that land belongs to indigenous people at some point might provide the experience that helps him live the new experience that changes his mind, but he's never going to get his mind changed. So I wonder if there, if the leadership uh, that, that thinks ourselves into a new way of living starts to live that in a way that helps bring other people along and just lives a new reality, and grow and I, I don't know exactly what that looks like well I, I think you know um, and bill reminds me of this when we talk sometimes because my tendency um is to um and, and this isn't all bad uh, don't get me wrong is to be disruptive of white supremacy um and to almost use the term reparations as a way to come on you know let's have this discussion yeah you know and there, there's this moment of, oh my gosh, you know, um, you know, among people who are allies or they're thinking about it, they're not quite sure what to do. Um, I think there needs to be a depository of 
uh, experiences where it is led to a, 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 a new sense of community, um, a new sense of foundness, a new sense of being at home and free. Um, and we're, I think, on the threshold of having some of those experiences. Right. Um, and I feel committed, um, you know, to my friends in this room to be a part of that research and that work going forward. But, you know, in some cases, you know, getting, getting land back, uh, you know, parcels here, parcels there, uh, doing some kind of direct uh, funding that doesn't have strings attached to tribes that then say, we, we got to, I'll just throw a number out there, you know, $150,000 from uh, a, a wealth surrender fund of Presbyterians and we're gonna build a solar um, uh, array on our education center, you know, with that. Well, that's, that's a great story, you know, that, that, you know, can excite, you know, a fair number of people, maybe your brother-in-law. Um, but we need to have those stories. And I think that's, that's something that maybe can come out of these kind of discussions you're having. Absolutely. Uh it was so striking. Um, she talked about the lived experience, you know, uh, one of the, the council member who came with me, uh, one of the two that came with me to that presentation, uh, he works for a private company that does transporting of prisoners um, in the Wisconsin prison system. Uh, and he used to work for the Shawn County Jail. And so he had, he had only ever seen one side of the Menominee people. Uh, but to then experience Rebecca Ebler uh, and her work that she does at the Sustainability Institute from the College of Menominee, uh, the whole ride home, you could just tell he was driving, you could tell he was in deep thought. Uh, and he, he's one of the big supporters now for this you know, community meal that we would like to do. Uh, it's so it's important. The relationship is important. Um, you know, I, I, I recognize that a lot of uh, my relationship was formed. I served three years in the Army. Uh, before that, I came from Lily White, uh, Iowa, which was even worse in diversity where I grew up than, than here. It wasn't until I got and, and had to form those kind of relationships with people who were, who were different than me that I began to really change as well. Um, the one and the one place that I really feel like is a great starting point, uh, and again, maybe there's already work that's been started on it, but is Legend Lake. You know, that that's a lake that is on the reservation that still predominantly the shoreline is owned by white people. Uh, that's just, that, that seems to me like one of the best places that we could start um, to think about returning some of that land. Uh, because even though there was, you know, as your brother-in-law says, that a treaty is only good till it's broken. Uh, and I don't believe that way. Uh, personally, I grew up with this sense of honor that yeah, I don't either. <laughs> right. Um, but then the question comes, you know, how, how do you begin that? And so it's just, I think, I, I agree. I think we're at a precipice in our country and in this area that I'm very excited to be here at this time in this community. Um, as this community is kind of brought forward from the 1970s into uh, the, at least early 2000s, I think we're finally getting there. Um, but I want to be conscious of time. Uh, I actually have a family reunion that I'm going to today as well over in Wassa. Um, so thank you for coming and joining us. And I hope that uh, the rest of your day is very good. Um, it is a shame about the air quality, I agree. It is not great over here too, uh, but hopefully the food is well and uh, that the bike ride or the walk uh, goes well too, so. It's, it's wonderful to uh, engage with another reparations Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Uriah. Right. See you on Tuesday. See you Tuesday. Thanks for your Take part. Take care, everyone. Yeah.